Hi, my name is Clinical Climates and you're watching a video on accommodation and convergence disorders. This video will provide a broad overview of the various conditions that relate to accommodation and convergence. Here I've provided you with a flow chart which summarises the various conditions that relate to disorders of accommodation and convergence. Starting off with accommodation, we can either have conditions that relate to deficient accommodation, excessive accommodation, or a failure to alter accommodation. With deficient accommodation, we have presbyopia, which you're all aware of and is normal, and we won't be discussing this in the video. And then we have conditions such as accommodative insufficiency and accommodative paralysis. In relation to excessive accommodation, we have what's called accommodative spasm, and the condition where we have a failure to alter accommodation is called accommodative inertia. With respect to convergence, again, we have conditions relating to, to deficient convergence and those related to excessive convergence. With excessive convergence, the condition is called convergence spasm. With deficient convergence, we have convergence insufficiency and convergence paralysis. Let's look at these in a little bit more detail. We'll commence with accommodation disorders. And here I've provided you with a table that summarises the conditions that relate to deficient accommodation or issues with changing or altering uh, accommodation. So these three here, insufficiency, fatigue and paresis or paralysis relate to deficient accommodation. And for insufficiency, we have the power of accommodation being below age normal. Whereas with fatigue, as the word suggests, or as the word fatigue suggests, accommodation reduces with continued use. In other words, it may start off being age normal, but as the patient uh, continues to utilise their accommodation, it reduces. With paralysis and paresis, we have either a fully or partly paralysed accommodation. Fully paralysed means we have paralysis. Partly paralysed means we have a paresis. So this is different from insufficiency here because we have an innovational issue here where um, accommodation is paralysed rather than just being below normal. And finally, we have accommodative inertia, which I mentioned earlier, is where we have difficulty in altering accommodation. Now, given that all these patients have an issue of some type with accommodation, one of the main complaints that they will present with is blurred vision. And then for those patients with insufficiency or fatigue, usually they'll also have asthenopic symptoms. So in managing these patients, we firstly need to consider the underlying cause. And we can see here that there are a variety of causes of accommodation disorders. So you'll need to explore this as it's important that any underlying cause is treated before you consider other management options. The other thing to consider is the working conditions of the patient and if they're doing excessive close work, etc., and to try and manage that where possible. If the patient is hypermetropic, uh, it's useful to correct the hypermetropia and a reading ad can assist these patients uh, given that they have deficient accommodation. And finally, with regards to orthoptics, these can be effective um, to some extent uh, and can be considered to be prescribed. Even exercises such as um, flippers, which relate to accommodation, uh, could be prescribed. Okay, moving on to convergence disorders and disorders related to deficient uh, convergence we have convergence insufficiency and convergence paralysis and paresis. Now you've studied convergence insufficiency in far more detail, so I'm not gonna go over it in this video. However, it's important to note that it is different from convergence paralysis and paresis, because as I indicated earlier, where you have a paralysis or paresis, you have an innovational issue to convergence. It's not simply a reduction in convergence. And so we can see here that the causes of a paralysis are far more sinister and severe than if you simply have convergence insufficiency. Now these patients are clearly going to be symptomatic and in particular 
they will be complaining of um, diplopia um, being caused from the exodeviation. So to manage them, we need to find the underlying cause and manage that underlying cause. And, and often uh, neurology or other uh, disciplines will be involved in assisting with that. And unfortunately, with these patients, uh, we can't give exercises to assist in improving convergence like we do in convergence and sufficiency. Because we have a paralysis of convergence, really all we can do is try and assist the patient with their double vision. And so to do this, we could give, for instance, base in prisms, or we could uh, provide occlusion. But giving convergence near point exercises tends not to be useful because they can't converge, it's paralyzed. And finally, we have excessive accommodation and convergence. So we have accommodative and convergence spasm. Now put these together because if you're gonna have accommodative spasm, you will have a convergence spasm and vice versa because of the synchinesis. So with an accommodative spasm, we expect that one of the initial complaints will be about blurred vision. Because you have a spasm of accommodation, what will happen is you're not able to control accommodation appropriately. It's in spasm and therefore you have blurred vision. The patient is generally doing more accommodation than they need to as they look further and further away. Now, with that comes the spasm of convergence, and that also leads to an esodeviation. And specifically, we'll see an esotropia. So a lot of patients will become manifest from the fact that they have an accommodative and convergent spasm. The diplopia will obviously be uncrossed because the patient has an esodeviation. The other thing a patient may notice is macropsia, where what they're looking at appears larger and this is because of the excessive amount of accommodation that the patient is doing. In terms of managing the patient, we need to obviously look at treating any underlying condition and looking at whether um, close-up work or their working conditions are of concern and whether we can manage any of this. In general, one of the best things to do with these patients is to stop them accommodating and paralyze accommodation. So to do this, you would prescribe 1% atropine daily atropine, so they put it in their eye every day for at least a couple of weeks, even possibly a month. Clearly the atropine will also cause blurred vision, so it's important that you ask your patients to purchase a cheap pair of readers for the period in which they're utilising that atropine. What you'll then do is wean the patient off the atropine and hopefully the patient can maintain their normal accommodation thereafter. Now, before prescribing the atropine, you should also correct any refractive error present. But it's important that you do not rely on a subjective refraction in patients with an accommodative and convergent spasm. A patient with an accommodative spasm will appear to be myopic when they're not. They're doing an increased amount of accommodation and therefore, when you present minus lenses, they will like it. And they will appear to be pseudomyopic. So if you rely on your subjective refraction, you could end up prescribing a myopic script, even though the patient has no myopia. So it's important that you actually perform a retinoscopy where you think the patient has an accommodative spasm, because you must knock out the accommodation in order to work out the refractive error. And you won't be surprised to find that the patient is actually hypermetropic when the subjective refraction provided you with a myopic uh, refractive error. Okay, a couple more things. You can prescribe orthoptics in these patients, uh, exercises such as negative relative fusion emergences, but you would do so after you've completed the atropine regime and once you have that accommodation back into control. And the final thing is that with an accommodative and convergent spasm, often the cause is functional. This means that the cause relates to some emotional disturbance, some stress that that patient is experiencing at that time. So if this is the case, uh, you should refer the patient on to counselling. Okay, that brings us to the conclusion of this video. Thank you for watching.